Hey kids, it's Mrs. Davis from Happy Place to Grow. And as you can see, I'm not in my learning corner today. That's because I'm traveling and I have arrived at a big city. I'm in Detroit, Michigan. You can see behind me the city view. I'm actually on the 13th floor of a high rise apartment building. And I thought it would be really cool if, because I'm in the city and there's a lots of different things going on in a city compared to a, the countryside, I thought it would be really cool for us to learn today about skyscrapers. And you can see in my view behind me some very tall buildings. I'm going to read this nonfiction book about skyscrapers. So before I start, because you know, skyscrapers are real buildings. Think for just a minute. What do you already know about tall buildings or skyscrapers? Well, I know you probably know a few things and I do too. However, this National Geographic Kids book about skyscrapers taught me a lot of really cool facts that I did not know. So I thought it would be interesting for us to read together and gather some new facts. And I think at the end of this nonfiction book, there is a quiz. So let's get started and listen carefully so we can learn about skyscrapers. Because maybe when you grow up, you wanna be an engineer and design these really cool buildings. So let's get started. Let me put on my reading glasses because there are lots of important facts to read skyscrapers. Now, because this is a nonfiction book that we are reading, there's a table of contents. So there's a lots of sections in this book. And at the bottom, it does say quiz whiz and glossary. A glossary is um, a sort of a dictionary that tells you about the information. It gives you uh, keywords in the glossary and what they mean. All right, let's get started. Now this is a long book because there's lots of facts. So just hang with me and we will go as quickly as possible. But I know you're gonna be very interested in this story because there's so many cool facts. A history of height. Throughout time, people have been fascinated with tall buildings. Ancient Egyptians built pyramids for their pharaohs and later on people built tall towers and giant cathedrals. Out of mortar and stone. But in the 1880s, two new ideas changed everything. One was using iron and steel skeleton and iron and steel skeleton to support a building. The other was the invention of a safe passenger elevator. And I know if I'm traveling in an elevator, I want it to be safe. Now buildings could be bigger, taller, and stronger. And that, my friends, is when the skyscraper was born. And if you look this, at this nonfiction book, it's gonna show us pictures and captions. So there's our pyramid, and then there's that cathedral, very tall. And I like this book too, because it has a lot of vocabulary. It's got, and they're calling their vocabulary building words because we're talking about buildings. And here, down here, it tells us the definition of a skeleton. That's not what your body has. It can also be associated, it has a multiple meaning. And for buildings, it is the supporting frame of something like a building and skyscraper is a very tall building. So those are two definitions. This building right here is the Empire State Building. Famous skyscrapers. So there is a drawing. You know, sometimes in nonfiction books, we have a lot of photographs, but sometimes they'll include drawings because maybe they don't have a photograph. So this is a drawing of the Chicago building, home insurance building. 
People first used the word skyscraper to describe a building in 1885. Oh, that's what they called the home insurance building in Chicago, Illinois, and that's here in the United States. It was. It was 10 stories or 138 feet tall and had an iron and steel skeleton. We know what a skeleton for a building is, right? A frame. Since then, people's ideas about skyscrapers have changed. And here's a fact that I thought was really interesting because it says many skyscrapers are built out of steel, but whether or not a building is called a skyscraper depends on how it compares to other buildings in the area. Here's a fact. I always thought skyscrapers were the super, super tall buildings, but in this book I found out that a skyscraper is just a building that in an area is one of the tallest buildings. So it doesn't have to be super, super tall to be called a skyscraper if it's taller than the other buildings in the area. So I would say this building over here is taller than lots of buildings in this area. So do you think that would be considered a skyscraper? I do. If a building stands out above other buildings, even if it's quite short, people could consider it a skyscraper. That was something I learned today. All right, here's another building word that has to do with skyscrapers and tall buildings. It's a story. You know, we think of stories like books that people read, but with when we're talking about buildings, a story is a floor in a skyscraper. So we found out that a skeleton and a story can have multiple meanings. And then right here, sometimes in nonfiction books, they'll have like a picture and a caption. And this book is the world's smallest skyscraper. And so if we read that, it would tell us about the, the newbie McMahon building. And I read that and it just said, there was a man, he said to the townspeople, I wanna build a skyscraper and they donated money. And they thought they were gonna get this really tall building and then it ended up being this short building and that was his skyscraper. Hmm, interesting fact. Over time, there have been many famous skyscrapers. Some are famous because of their height. In 2017, the world's tallest skyscraper is, now when I saw this name at first, it gave me a little trouble. You know, in nonfiction books, sometimes there are difficult names because they're real names. But I love how in this National Geographic, they've got it broken down so I could sound it out. It says the Burj Khalifa, and that helped me. So don't be intimidated to read nonfiction books that have hard words because a lot of times they'll sound it out for you. Or I just try to do the best I can with these unusual words and keep on learning and keep on reading. And this building is in Dubai, Dubai, United Arab Emirates. That's another place, that's another country. It is 2,717 feet tall and has 163 floors. And I'm glad we know now about those levels and buildings. And this is the building photograph. Other skyscrapers were famous because of their design. So it could be famous either because of height or design. Now this building here, they said, is different looking. Do you think it looks different? I do. It says it looks like a bottle opener. This building is in Shanghai, the Shanghai World Financial Center. It's 1,614 feet. You can find it in China. It has a four-sided hole cut out at its top. And then this building here looks like a sailboat. Isn't that beautiful with the night sky? That building is located in Burj Al Arab. It's 1,053 feet. It's also in Dubai. Dubai. I'm trying the best I can to pronounce these. I'm gonna keep on reading though, because again, I'm not gonna be intimidated by nonfiction words I can learn and grow. Here we go, let's keep reading. Some skyscrapers are famous because they create a skyline that makes the city easy to recognize. 
So this would be our skyline, and that's one of our building words, skyline. The outline of objects such as buildings against the background of the sky. And you can see my skyline. Isn't that cool? That's why I really wanted to read. I know the lighting's kind of weird here, but I just thought it'd be great to read in the city. There are more skyscrapers in Hong Kong than anywhere else in the world. Other cities with famous skylines include New York City, Shanghai, China, Dubai, UAE, and Sydney, Australia. Now this is a cool fact. Look at this guy right here. You can see he's in between two buildings. He loves to scale skyscrapers. Let's find out. His name is Elaine Robert. He's known as the French Spider-Man. Spider-Man? Sp he's a true Spider-Man. <laughs> he climbed more than 100 skyscrapers, most using just his bare hands and chalk to keep from his hands from slipping. Ooh, would you do that? No way, I wouldn't. I know some of you probably would love to do that. You're adventurous. Okay, here's a question as the title, it says, why build skyscrapers? So why do people want to even build skyscrapers? I wonder if you can think of what the answer might be as you're thinking about that question. Why would people want to buy a build a skyscraper anyway? When you see a giant skyscraper, one question you may ask is why would people build something tall like that? The answer most likely has to do with money, space, and technology. That's why people first started building skyscrapers. In the early 1800s, New York City became, a, the, became the finance center of the United States. But in 1835, a giant fire destroyed nearly 700 buildings in a section of the city called Manhattan. Everything had to be rebuilt. You know, sometimes bad things happen but in response to it, new things can bloom and occur and new technologies can be developed. When there's a problem, people are problem solvers and skyscrapers definitely were problem solvers. This drawing right here, it says, is another little drawing and it says, that's what it looked like before that big fire. And then our building words on this page, technology, the use of scientific tools and methods for a practical reason, and then finance, the business of managing money for a person, company, or government. So again, we've got lots of vocabulary with our nonfiction. This is what a drawing of what the city looked like when the, it was burning and there was a fire. It lasted two days, this little headline says. Okay, so I'm going to kind of just reread as I go on. Everything had to be rebuilt, but on this page it says land was expensive and more and more people kept moving to the city. There wasn't much space on the ground, so they started to build upward. Okay, so why do people build skyscrapers? If there's a lack of space on the ground, we're gonna go up. That is a problem solving. Now this page is really interesting because as the buildings got higher, then there was a problem with the materials. As they rebuilt, the people of New York were limited by technology. Bricks and mortar couldn't support the height and the weight of very tall buildings. And who wanted to climb that many stairs anyway? For these reasons, the tallest new building in New York in the 1850s was just five stories high. So there were again encountering problems, but I love how when we're in, when we encounter problems, it causes us to think and have to solve problems. And that's how things, technologies are born and new inventions are created. Problems can be helpers to us. And this little picture here shows a man named Elisha Graves Otis. 
he helped build a safe elevator because when they were building elevators, the cables would break. So he helped build an elevator that was safer and had a rope stop to it. So if you have an elevator, you want to be able to have safety. While all this was going on in New York, the city of Chicago, Illinois, was also growing quickly from 1830 to 1870. It grew from 50 people to nearly 300,000 people. Many people came for jobs. Because of Chicago's location in the middle of the United States, a city, the city was a railroad center for the country. Much trade and business passed through the city. And then here it says, there was another fire, but this time in Chicago, and a lot of buildings were burned, 18,000. So the great fire of Chicago. Now this guy, look here, he looks kind of funny, doesn't he? But he's an inventor, making steel in 1856. English inventor Harry Bessemer discovered a new way to make steel, again, if there's a problem, there's got to be somebody to solve it. This guy was solving the, the problem of the bricks and mortar being too heavy. Before this, it was slow and a costly process to make steel. Bessemer invented a machine that made steel quickly. It could make big sheets of steel and it was inexpensive. That means less money. So if you're building, you don't want it to cost a lot. You want to try to build the best that you can for the most um, bang for your buck for the least amount of money. And by this time, elevators were safe and building materials were made of iron and steel and the iron and steel were available. Chicago was ready to build its first skyscraper. Getting off the ground. Building a skyscraper takes more than steel, iron, and elevators. People also need to plan. Buildings must be built in a way that protects against gravity. Gravity can pull tall buildings to the ground. So when you're thinking about building and technology, you have to also think about nature and the forces. So gravity, gravity is our building word here and it says, the force that pulls objects toward the center of the planet or other body. This is the Woolworth building. It's a tall skyscraper. Ancient Egyptians built pyramids that had large bottoms and small tops. The bottom or the base of the pyramid supports its weight. This helps pyramids fight against gravity. But these pyramids are in the middle of the desert. There's a lot of space there. In the cities, remember, that's a problem. There's less space. That's why they wanted to go taller. While this ideal worked, it limited how tall new buildings could be because there was less space and less land. I love this picture. Look at those workers. They're on a beam and they're high above the ground. Ooh, would you do that? I just get nervous for these guys. Look at that photo. They were brave. People needed a way to build a tall building with a smaller base. Steel made this possible. But steel beams were large and expensive. They had to be shipped in and stored. The, and people needed heavy duty equipment to move them. Because of this, some people made buildings out of concrete. So, you know, they're having to juggle around and figure out how to build the best building with the um, least amount of work and workers and trouble. So they had to guess and test on things, right? Concrete is a mixture of cement, sand, and broken rocks and water. It's cheaper than steel and it can be made on site. Concrete gets very hard when it dries, so it, so it can support a lot of weight, but concrete cracks if it's put under too much pressure. People needed to, a better idea, so they started to reinforce or strengthen concrete with steel bars. So this is a building that they were using concrete, but then they made the frame of it out of um, the steel bars. So they're putting different materials to work and guessing and testing out. Pretty interesting. Now this shows a plan. Remember, if you're making a building, there has to be a plan, any great design 
has to be first thought out. You have to know math figures. You have to understand that materials have weight. And so you have to be very smart to build these buildings. And I know you are up to this challenge out there. You might want to be in this position, maybe not building the buildings, but you're the planner. You've got to know your math. You've got to be able to calculate things out. New technologies didn't just help people build tall buildings. They also help people solve problems inside. If a building's frame is made of, out of steel or reinforced concrete, its inner walls and floors help support it. This means the building's outer walls don't have to be as thick. And that leaves more space inside the building for bigger rooms. Getting away from thick, solid outer walls also solved the problem of light. Many older buildings were very dark, but now there could be more windows. Builders could even make the curtain wall or outer covering of a skyscraper out of glass. And thus is born all of the beautiful glass buildings. There's one behind me that has so much glass. It's this rounded building, cylinder shape, columns has lots of glass. This building that I'm in also has lots of glass windows which bring in the beautiful light. A curtain wall is our next building word. We're learning a lot of vocabulary. The outer covering of a skyscraper. Here are seven cool facts. Number one, the Empire State Building was for 41 years the tallest building. It had that title for 41 years. People used fact two. People used the word skyscraper not only to, des to describe a tall building, but also anything that was tall that stuck up in the air, including horses, people, and even hats. <laughs> Would you think of that as a skyscraper? Weird. In 2012, builders constructed a 30-story T30 skyscraper in China in just 15 days. Hmm. They went ahead and pre-made lots of things and put it together very quickly. In 2005, this helipad on top of a tall skyscraper in um, Burj Al Arab was temporarily changed into a tennis court so that Andrew, Andre Agassi and Roger Federer played a match on top of that building. The elevators in the Shanghai Tower in Shanghai, China can travel up to 46 miles per hour. They take people this, to the second level in the basement of the 119th floor in less than a minute. Whoa, fast. And then here's a cool fact. If you're brave, you might be interested in this stunt. On August 7th, 1974, Frenchman Philippe Pettit put a steel cable between two towers of the World Trade Center in New York City. For 45 minutes, he walked across that cable. It was 1,300 feet off the ground. Whoa, brave or crazy. What do you think? Ha, huh, not me, I'm not going up there. Now I love this section. It says working with the nature because you know, if you're thinking about buildings, again, we already talked about gravity, but also there's natural things going on that would affect these tall buildings. I thought this section was really interesting. Here is a diagram and it's got sort of a step-by-step -step, um, for us as we're reading through this. It says, well, when building a skyscraper, people must think about nature. The first thing to consider is the ground below. You need a strong, stable base. Well, that makes sense. You need, so when people build a skyscraper today, they dig until they hit hard, solid ground. They fill in the holes with concrete to build supports. They put concrete caps on the supports. So that's show, showing like a step-by-step, -step. they have to drill down. I wouldn't think that about that. I would just be like, 
ground feels solid, I'm gonna build up on top of it. But they go and dig low until they find the hardest part of the earth and then they fill it in with concrete and it looks like steel um, ground, concrete supports, and then this, they start building these steel columns. So there's a lot to think about. Once the base is sturdy, they start to build up. So your, your support, your foundation has to be strong before you can build up. And I'm glad because I'm in this building right now and I'm really glad that that occurred or who knows, this building might be toppling over because yesterday it was super windy, the wind was blowing, and this building was actually moving and you could hear it. Once the base is sturdy, they start to build up. They make a skeleton out of concrete, steel, or a combination of these materials. Columns go up, beams go across each floor. The strong base and strong skeleton work together to help the skyscraper resist the natural force of gravity, which is always pulling things down. So here's our step-by-step. -step. Builders must also consider whether changes in temperature, for example, can affect metals. Metals expand when temperatures are hot and they contract when they're cold. And that's our building words down here that says expand means to pull apart, contract, push together. So there's a lot to consider when you're building a high rise. Over time, this can cause metals to crack or to change shape. And again, you want the builders to consider that if you live in a high rise, you want them to make sure those things are okay. Wind can cause problems. I was telling you about the wind here yesterday. Wind moves skyscrapers back and forth. I did experience that. Skyscrapers must be strong but they must also be flexible. If the tall buildings don't move when the wind blows, pressure from the wind will damage them. To keep this from happening, builders sometimes cross steel beams between columns like an X. I'm so thankful for that, because I'm in one, and it was windy yesterday. The X brace the building against the wind, and then, this is the Empire State Building. So this little section says it was built to be a natural lightning rod. Cause you know, tall buildings are gonna catch lightning for sure. Now another natural occurrence in nature could be earthquakes. That's a big problem for buildings. Earthquakes can make the ground move and this can cause buildings to get badly damaged. Builders add parts to skyscrapers to try to keep this from happening. So this building here has extra reinforcements just in case there's an earthquake. Buildings in an earthquake, this diagram shows, you know, in nonfiction, there's lots of diagrams. It's showing how this building's base can be flexible if there's an earthquake. Sometimes builders use dampers or other parts called shock absorbers. These parts keep skyscrapers steady and limit movement in an earthquake. Builders can also put rubber pads and rollers between the skyscraper and its base. These parts move sideways during an earthquake. And I'm sure where there's in places where there are lots of earthquakes, this is definitely the way they're building. They carry the weight of the building with them so the building moves, but it doesn't fall over. You know, I'm just amazed at how people, again, have to brainstorm, to think, to solve problems. And it just causes me to be really in awe of all these amazing buildings and what it actually took to build them. It's just not going out there and putting um, steel and bricks together and workers working. There has to be a lot of planning, a lot of problem solving, a lot of developing. It's amazing, don't you think? Going green. Now, even though I'm in a city, you can also see that there are lots of green places because in a city, there's lots of buildings, but we also wanna have nature. So that's in, taken into consideration. Big buildings use a lot of energy. Since the year 2000, people have designed skyscrapers that use less energy. 
they have also found ways to save energy in skyscrapers that were already built. One simple ideal is to change the light bulbs. New types of light bulbs use less energy than the old ones. Another way to save energy is to replace the windows. So again, we're thinking about our planet and even though we're solving problems and we're trying to build up so that we have more space for people, we're also thinking about our planet and keeping it green and clean. So changing out the windows and the lights definitely help because if you have those special kind of windows, it's going to help the temperature in the building. Big buildings also use a lot of water. An easy way to save water is to update the faucets and fixture, fixtures that people use to get the waters. So we're updating the light bulbs, we're updating the windows, we're changing out into water saving um, faucets so that we can, again, keep our tall buildings, keep our beautiful technology that we've developed, but also save planet Earth. Pretty cool. It says some buildings don't just save water, they use energy, they save energy by using water in different ways. There's a three-story waterfall in the Hearst Tower in New York City. The water comes from rain outside, the waterfall cools the area inside. That's cool, look at that cool building, amazing. Some skyscrapers make their own energy. The Pearl River Tower, which is 1,015 feet in China, does this with wind. The building has four great openings. As wind moves through the openings, giant turbines inside the building turn to make energy. And then our building word says turbine, an engine with a part that has blades. The blades spin when, when water, air, or stream moves past them. I love these buildings. They're phasing in man-made with nature-made. I love that. Some sky skyscrapers use nature in different ways. Basco Vertical or Vertical Forest in Italian is the name of two skyscrapers which are 380 feet and 279 feet in Milan, Italy. These skyscrapers are covered with plants and trees. The plants make oxygen and reduce smog. They also block outside noise and help keep the building cool. So we can get smarter, but we can be wiser with the world. What's up with skyscrapers now? That's a question. Many things have changed since the world's first skyscraper. Boy, we've seen those changes, haven't we? One thing is location. For many years, most of the tallest buildings were in North America, but not anymore. Today, the world's tallest buildings are rising in Asia and the Middle East. That's because these places have lots of people and open land. They also have money to build those tall skyscrapers. So we're expanding the building with skyscrapers. And this is the skyline of Shanghai, China. Beautiful. Another thing that has changed since the first skyscrapers were built is height. I think they just keep getting taller. They're taller and taller. The first building to change people's ideas about height was the Chrysler Building in New York. Completed in 1930, it won the title of World's Tallest Building. It was the first super tall skyscraper ever built. Today, any building taller than 984 feet, the height of the Eiffel Tower in Paris, France, is called a super, is called super tall, a super tall. Ooh, that's a new fact. So skyscrapers are one way to describe a building, but if the building is taller than 984 feet, then it's a super tall. There are now more than 100 super talls. So there's that Chrysler building. And then this is weird but true. I love when nonfiction books give us weird facts. 
It says in 2013, sunlight bounced off the windows of a skyscraper in London, England. It was so hot that it melted parts of cars. Uh, you know, nature and buildings can work together or they can cause problems. Hmm. I love this timeline. You know, nonfiction books have lots of ways to teach us. This timeline shows us the history of the tallest buildings. And it goes from 1913 to 2020. So I love that timeline. That's just a quick look. But super tall doesn't seem to be tall enough anymore. People have started to build mega tall skyscrapers. These buildings, which are at least 1,968 feet tall, are more than twice as tall as the shortest super tall. We're just always trying to outdo. Amazing. For now, just three mega talls rule the skies, but that will change. You know that will. Builders hope to finish the Jeddah Tower in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia in 2020. Well, it's now 2022 and this book was built. I'm sure that's already occurred. Hey, that might be a good thing to research. Have they built this Jeddah Tower in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia? Because it was supposed to be built in 2020. Hmm, I think I'm gonna look that up. The sky isn't the limit anymore. Look at that building. Amazing. Okay, we're at the end of our nonfiction. Let's take this quiz because sometimes nonfiction books have a quiz. Question number one, when was the word skyscraper first used to describe a building? I'm gonna read the dates and then you see if you can guess. And this is a multiple choice. A, 1607, B, 1885, C, 1903, or D, 1992 or 1972 what do you think question two what two inventions made it possible to build skyscrapers a steel and glass b iron and steel c steel and elevators or d concrete concrete and glass and you know when you have multiple choice they will give you several good answers or answers that are could be right. So when I'm thinking about um, multiple choice, I wanna eliminate answers that I know are not true and then just narrow it down. I'm gonna put the answers on a separate little slide at the end of this video. So you keep guessing. The blank is the supporting frame of a skyscraper. A, curtain wall, story is B, C, skyline, or D, skeleton. I bet you know that one. Okay, question four. As of 2017, blank is the tallest skyscraper. A, the Empire State Building. B, the Home Insurance Building. C, Burj Khalifa, again, these hard words, or D, Tay Pai 101. Question five, in which city was the first skyscraper built? A, Chicago, Illinois, B, New York City, C, Shanghai, China, or D, Dubai, United Arab Emirates. Question six, what is a skyscraper called that is taller than 984 feet. I bet you can get this one. We just talked about it. A mega tall, a super tall, mighty tall is C or D, a very tall. And last question, where are most of the skyscrapers being built today? I bet you can get this one too. A, North America and South America, B, Europe and Asia, C, Australia and Africa, or D, Asia and the Middle East. All right. How do you think you did on that quiz? That was a lot of information. I am gonna put the quiz and the answers 
at the end of this video in a separate little slide so that you can think about it. You might have to rewind a little. All right, kids. I hope that you enjoyed reading Skyscrapers with me. I know this was a long nonfiction, so um, I'm glad you stuck with me. If you took a pause in it and then listened to later, that's always good too. All right, I'm gonna go check out the city and I'm going to discover some really cool things in the city of Detroit. And as always, until our next video, keep problem solving, keep dreaming, keep thinking about what you might want to do when you grow up. Maybe you're going to build a skyscraper or maybe you're just going to visit one like me. All right, kids, until our next time together, as always, have a